the first thing I did was I went to the CDH Decklist database and I found first chain food sliver. And did I say it right this time? <laughs> no, you no, said, I said it wrong again. Food sliver. <laughs> Welcome to the Play to Win podcast, where we talk about winning in CEDH. I'm Cam. And I'm Dylan. And uh, this week, uh, we got a couple of different topics we're going to talk about. Um, the first topic is actually submitted to us by our $100 patron, Demon of... Uh, Raz we, Grease. Raz Grease. Raz yes. Grease. We were just corrected on this <laughs> uh, when they were going to choose their uh, their perk for being a $100 patron. Um, the perk that they chose is that they had a topic that they um, have selected for us to talk about today. Right. Well, let's go ahead and do the, the podcast question. Then the decision I have made in the non-EDH miscellaneous magic, how do you brew? How do you brew? So, yeah, this is kind of a loaded this question deep, right off the bat, question. right? So this is, I, 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 I want to say specifically, this is going to be a conversation about how you and I specifically attack it. Dylan and Cam of yes. Play to Win, how we are brewing in CDH. Yes. Now, I got to tell you, I am not the best brewer. Right. There are a lot okay. of people out there that are better than me. But I still have a ton of fun brewing, and I think that's all that matters. I know my strengths more than any other player out there. <laughs> We have the stats to prove it, actually. Exactly, we right? Like them. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, build decks to, you know, win games, but also build decks uh, to, you know, go along with your play style and what you're looking for, too. Yeah. How, do you want to go first? Do you have something in mind or you want me to go? Because I got an answer. Oh, go for it. Go for it. Lock and load. So for me, nowadays, most of the time, my brewing involves brewing for new sets. A lot of the times that when we're making new decks, I'm making a new deck from a commander that got printed, and I'm kind of taking a lot from decks that it's similar to already. Most of the time, that's how new CDH decks are built, besides, you know, rare explosions like Winota. And even Winota was kind of a, a copy off of another Stax deck, sort of, at one point. So the way that I normally start is I, I find out what I'm playing. So, so say for this time, what did I build? A Trax at this time. Yeah. So this one, it's going to feel a little bit like a cop-out, but, like, the first thing I did was I went to the CDH decklist database, and I found First Chain Food Sliver. And did I say it right this time? No, you no, said, I said it wrong again. Food sliver. <laughs> food sliver first chain. There we go. That's not it either. <laughs> first sliver food chain? There you there go. There we go. We got it. So I'll go to a deck like that and say, okay, I basically want to build this deck, except I can't have red cards. So I'm just going to copy. I'm going to duplicate this list from Oxfield. I'm going to take out all the red cards. And then I just kind of add in my, the little fun cards from my brain knowledge of CDH that, uh, that I like for that deck and go from there. So very rarely am I kind of like starting from scratch on a deck, add Soul Ring, add Mana Crypt. More often than not, I'm kind of duplicating a, another list, taking out 15 or 20 cards and subbing in another 15 or 20 cards. And that's how I come to a lot of the decks that, that I build right now. See, a lot of my brewing is in the same way now, too, where a lot of it is for commanders that are coming out in new sets. Um, but occasionally, I, I have looked into commanders that have been out there, and I've had not a lot of success with what I've come up with. Yeah, I, I've kind of just understood that, like, deck building isn't my forte. It's not yeah. what I'm best at. Like you said, like, I'm, I like doing it. It's fun. But more often than not, the deck that I'm piloting is going to probably be have built by somebody else. Like, the Winota's list that I'm playing is Ian's Winota list. The Kest list I'm playing is kind of my Kest list, but it's really the database is, like, again, minus around 10 cards. Um, that's just because I think CDH is power level is so high there just aren't that many flex slots i in my opinion so many of the cards that i see in other people's lists are just cards that i agree with so my, my brewing is it's not a from scratch thing it's kind of a modifying from other people and taking cards in and out that i see fit for me like one of them is wheel of misfortune as oh, soon as i see that card out right away yeah gone. there's a couple that i'm i'm very similar to you where like i will take someone's list but i will snipe out the yeah. bad cards that i don't agree with yeah and wheel of misfortune is the first card get that, that out of here i say get out of here especially in like an ad nauseum deck they just they can just i it has never worked out in my favor and i've never seen it particularly great and every time my opponent casts one i say fantastic <laughs> great yeah this is gonna work out for me no matter what. Right. Right. And then, you get to decide. You can right, decide yeah. if you will or not. And almost always you can you can guess the number. You know what I mean? Especially if you yeah. don't want to wheel, zero, just say zero. You don't have to guess it. You don't have to wheel, right? Right. Any card that gives your opponents a choice yeah, is for what's bad. good for them is not good. It's I, not I good. understand the argument for Wheel of Misfortune is you can normally get it to be a three mana, discard your hand, draw seven. Who cares what your opponent's doing because you're a turbo deck and you want more wheel effects. I understand that's why it's good. 
I just I disagree with the amount of life that you oftentimes have to pay in order to cast this thing. Because if you do this after an ad nauseum, you can't because you can't spend enough life. If you no. have three life left after an ad nauseum, you know someone's just going to bid four life and then you can't cast the card. Like it's not going to work out. A hundred percent. And then you don't win the game and then you do the classic wheel thing where the next person wins right. the game. Yeah. So it's really only good if you have a lot of life total, I think, right? Because if someone can just bid more life than you have access to, you don't wheel. That's how the card works, right? I'm remembering it right. Yeah. Only the people that don't. I don't even. You know what? <laughs> I. We're moving on from that card because oh, we don't have to talk about this morning. No, I don't want to but talk about it. Sucks it sucks it, it's right? too confusing. I don't even want to think about the words because it's not worth the brain space. Right? Yeah, that's what's going on. Yep. No, so, but and there are other cards too. I the, but that are normally ones that I'll just like take out right away. They're just they don't fit my play style. A lot style. of the cards that we've complained about on the channel before. Right. That yeah. you can just click on like last week's video about counter spells. You can see <laughs> yeah. other cards we might take out if they're in there. Yeah. What's the new one? Mental miss. Mine Minor misstep. Minor yeah, but like seeing like spell snare in there, like I'm. Oh yeah, spell I'll cut out, out spell right snare away. and like I'll swap it out with other um, counters that I want to. Yeah. Uh, sometimes if there's other win conditions that I'd rather play to, mm -hmm. I might like try to make a room for some of those win conditions as well. Um, so I don't, I don't typically play like an exact 99 that I find, but I'll play like a. Like a 93 to a 97. That's it's, very similar. It's modifying. It's tweaking. That's, exactly. That's kind of what I think draws a lot of players to CEDH is like the optimization aspect of it is like you just you want to make your commander deck better and better and eventually you find CEDH. So I think we're all kind of drawn to that style of deck building of just like find somebody else's list and let me just tweak it and tweak it and tweak it and tweak it. And then by the time it's like 20 cards different, that's like a whole different list at that point. So. Exactly, right? That gets in a whole different category. So there are times that I will brew from scratch there's a lot yeah. of times like uh, when i built glissa sure. that was building from scratch so you just went soul ring so <laughs> yeah i Manic just i <laughs> went into moxfield i just typed in all those cards individually yeah. and i pulled up a couple of other lists that i could reference as well sure i was i took a look at some other uh like glissa lists that were from the old glissa because there are some good cards with First Strike and Death Touch yep. that work well. It's unfortunate that New Glissa didn't deal with artifacts. Um, but I also, uh, you know, when I realized that sagas were an option, you know, I could go take a look at some sagas. Are there any good sagas in Golgari? No, there's, there there's are like not. five. There are like four and five mana. But you got um, to you looked there. You I did about look it. there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. I did think about it. Like I could have. There's a four mana one that's a removal spell that could have been pretty good that Close. I could have played. But maybe in the casual version. Right. Yeah, and, and something like that. Um, but you know, and then I also took a look at the old Yorok list that I built, the you're locked out of the game stack stack sure. that I built. Um, cause that was in, you know, very similar colors and that's kind of where I got the opposition agent in Maryland idea. Okay. Oh yeah. That makes sense. Right. So like there are situations where I'll go like that, but in those kind of cases, I end up getting to like 85 cards and I'm like, okay. Now what? <laughs> like, so you're at 85 total cards and you can't fill the last slot? And, and then I'm like, okay, well, now I just need like other cards that are, like, I'm less excited to play. Dude, really? I'm almost always the opposite. I'm always at like 130 cards and I go, oh, shit, I have to cut some of these cards now. Oh, uh, no, because I, I take like the best like 62. Okay. Like, and not, and not including, just yo, the, yeah, including just the, the bare lands. bones, yeah. just the staples. And I just go, man, if I could just play this deck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just play this, this 60 card deck instead. This thing single, slaps. Every single card that I add to the list makes it worse. I guess now when you're I'm in Golgari and cards. you're like adding Autumn's Veil and you're like, hey, this is not good anymore. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anytime you have to, are you putting in a card in your lower color decks that you wouldn't play in your higher color decks? I feel like, like that always feels a little bit bad. Although it's unique and fun to play different cards sometimes, you know that Autumn's Veil is just not good enough. But because you're only in Golgari and you need protection, you need it because it's like the only thing in your colors that does that. And it, it does the job. Like it does what it needs to, but it's just not, you would much rather like a counter spell or something. No, yeah. But. but like, yeah, all the times that I've gone back and tried to brew something with like older commanders that I hadn't seen before, it hasn't really worked out for me. How long did I spend on Ikra brews? You snooze, you lose. I spent months. I spent months on that deck. And what was your final record with it? Like I think two and fifteen. I, I think on the channel it's two and eleven. Two and eleven. Okay. I think that's what it is on the channel. I've won more games off the channel. Okay. Um, and I have done some pretty weird stuff with that deck, but it, it's not. It, it's just not good. It's not a good performer under pressure. No, it's no. it's really not. No, <laughs> when you really like put a scalpel to it and like 
try to dissect what it's doing. Yeah. It's not very competitive, really. So I usually like to steer, stay clear from <laughs> what direction my imagination goes. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. I, so that's why you want to keep a, a low cart. You have a low count yeah. in the beginning when you're building decks. You don't, you don't want to go too wild at first. No, I don't want to go too wild. Understood. Yeah. Understood. So how does that change when you look at casual? Dude, for casual, for me, is much different. I have, like, a whole list of cards. Like, I have my own personal ban list for casual that of cards that I won't touch. I have – I always got to stick to a theme. For casual, I really try to do, like, the casual aspect of it. Right, yeah. Um, I make the decks powerful or whatever, but every card always has to service, like, the theme. That's my big thing for casual. That's how I brew with that one. We don't have to spend too much time talking about casual decks on a CDH podcast. But I guess that's fair. But yeah. for me, that's, that's normally how I do. I pick a theme, vampires, lands, um – uh, equipments, but I, my Rafik has like a, so I have a Rafik equipment list, but it uh, specifically is swords. So swords of fire and ice, swords of feast and famine. So there's no cards that like target it that are a color because I it's gonna have protection from a lot of colors. Yeah. So I have to find creative ways to service the theme of it being an equipment deck, but it's a specifically a swords deck. So I don't play things like Mother of Runes because that's a white card that gets protection. I'm gonna go on. I can go on forever about my casual decks because they're all my babies. But for casual, I have a much more like I'm gonna stick to my little theme on these decks. But for yeah. CDH, I just want to copy the deck who's winning the most and take out Wheel of Misfortune and put in something fun. And that's and then that's my deck now. Well, <laughs> yes, I totally feel that. I totally feel that. Yeah. Well, I have a couple of uh, CEDH situations. CEDH situations. CEDH situations. Is this a right? new, Oh, this is like a. Uh, can this be like a new part of the podcast? Like. Next up, after our Patreon thing, we move to the CDH situations. Oh, yeah. Here we go. It has, yeah. a, good, it has a good ring to it. Okay. Yeah, right. Here's a CEDH situation for you. Give it to me. Okay. Um, so your opponent has Timna. Great. Not when great. But okay, sure. When is it right to block Timna and when is it wrong to block Timna? Oh, I am a Timna player, so I'm going to give you a biased answer and never block Timna. <laughs> um, no, let's, let's talk about this <laughs> as, okay. a Timna player, yeah. as a Timna player. As a Timna player. Yeah. When do you not want to see people block? That's tough. So, like, there's the obvious of, like, I don't want to lose off of no value. If you have a 3-4, yeah. I don't want to attack, obviously. Like, so I'm not going to talk about that. So, like, when is it appropriate for me to offer the trade and when is it not? I think if it's, like, a – it depends. If it's, like, a commander – the only reason – the only way I can think about it is in, in examples. is like, something like a Kinnon. I probably wouldn't – offer that trade for Kinnon if Kinnon is doing well because Kinnon can make a lot of mana and can recast itself pretty easily I think a lot of the time yeah but if it were a situation where um, someone had, let's say, let me think, what's a good Hermit Druid's not a good example because it's a one-one. But no, and Hermit Druid normally won't block a Tim though. I yeah, like uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like but that's like a when collector I collector oof. Like a collector, a collector oof, oof yeah. seems like a like an interesting trade option that might come. Definitely, up. if it's if the if the only block available for them is something that would get rid of some, like a stack piece that's inhibiting me, that's definitely time where I would offer up the trade or leave. The, I, I would probably never leave the Tim to back because they wouldn't offer that attack towards me. Like, if they had a collector roof, they're not going to attack an untapped That's true. Timna. Yeah, the, the stacks creatures typically will stay back and guard. Yeah, they'll make sure that they can clear, especially. But they know. But I will offer that trade to the collector roof player, even if they probably won't take it. That's the times when I will try to make sure that, like, I'll not be afraid to attack into their 2-2. When, they, when their 2-2 is a stacks piece, that's hurting somebody else. That makes sense. That, that makes Was sense. that the question? When to, is when's to kill, block it or when's to... I, I I don't know if I phrased the question I, exactly I, I correct. I think I but answered it from the Timna player's perspective, but I think the answer, the well, question is... Well, that's kind is, of the question that I then posed to okay, you, like, okay. from the Timna perspective, yeah. I, I'm only offering the trade if it's something that I would like to be removed. That, that sounds kind of straightforward, but, like, Otherwise, I'm not going to risk Timna because, like, if it's something that's going to win the game, like, I, the reason I gave Hermitude example because it, it just as an example of a creature that if it untaps, it'll win the game. If there's for some reason an untapped Kiki Jiki, I'm attacking my Timna into your Kiki Jiki. Yeah. If that gets rid of your combo piece, great. I can re, re, can yeah. re put my Timna. What I don't want to make the trade on is like value pieces because. Timna is my value. So for me to have to invest more mana, especially knowing that you can do it too, I feel like that kind of time walks me. Like if I trade for a Kinnon, Kinnon casts again for two mana, Timna casts again for two mana, but my Timna is three starts. So mine's now five where there's four and they're a mana deck. So I feel like I kind of time walk myself in that yeah. situation. That's a specific example, but situations like that where you're trading for value, I feel like I don't want to trade my Timna. But if, if it's trading, trading for stacks piece, I, I want to trade my Timna for that. That makes sense. Okay, so if the Timna player is coming at you you and you have the piece uh, in play that seems like it's uh, kind of messing them up 
I feel like there's a clear time where you do not want Never to mind. block Tim. Though. And it's, yeah. it's, I feel like it is in that kind of scenario more worth it for you to draw a card. Yeah. It, the chance of that card that you draw being something that deals with your collector oof or your magus for the moon, like whatever other yeah. you know thing that's gonna trade with it is, um, you know, it's it, it's much better for you just to keep that up, still make sure that you can't do anything, and then you know use that to buy a time. Yeah, definitely. Keeping Timna around over a long period of time is just gonna net you so many more cards over time. So being able to make sure that you can continuously get in for value. Like, I don't think using Timna as like a, a removal piece is not really good. You don't want to force your, like, you don't want to force your opponent with two mana dorks to block your Timna and get no. a two for one. Who cares? Get, you, know, that, you know, that's not getting rid of their mana. Producing. No, that's not what you're They're looking They're not going to block anyway, and, and it's not worth it if you think that they might. But that just goes along with the value. Don't trade your Timna for value. Trade it for actual Stacks piece removal, like yeah. something that actually needs to get off the board. Something if, that's if you're matter. given the option or you think you have the option to do that. Yeah, I feel like Tim also just like doesn't attack a lot of the time either. Tim will just kind of like stay back. Yeah, I mean it depends. Often it depends on the pod so much. Like there, if there is a single deck that is not a big creature deck, like it's a polymorph deck or a mono blue deck or something like that. I mean Urza has a construct, but there's a lot of mono blue decks that don't have a lot of blockers. Tim can normally get into one of those, but if you're in like. Uh, in like near like the finals, like if you have a tournament or something like that, where a lot of the decks end up being super refined versions. A lot of them are four color piles where they're also playing Thrasios and one three is like your worst nightmare for a Timna deck because you fucking can't get through it. <laughs> um, so there's situations like that where Timna is obviously attacking a lot less just because it can't get through anywhere. There's an untapped Krom and there's an untapped Thrasios and it's not going to do anything if it attacks besides maybe, you know, gaining two life off of, you know, bouncing off of Thrasios. Yeah, that's true. And there are a lot more creatures that are being seen on in tables at all times now, too. Yeah, creatures um, are getting better. There's more yeah, creatures in play. Ledger Shredder is one that comes up a lot more now, too, and that comes in as a 1-3, which is also a nightmare scenario. Yep. Ranger Captain of Eos just continues to see more and more Winoda uh, popularity. Is obviously a very popular deck that is, oh, has like cow. over 50 creatures in it. <laughs> that just basically shuts off Tim at that point then, yeah. too. Um, Does that mean that Tim is getting worse? I don't think so. Though. Well, because Timna still feels good to me. Timna, well, as Timna gets worse, Timna gets better because Timna also has access to all the creatures that are getting printed too. That's true. And Timna can play Ledger of Shredder, half. and it's really good in Timna. Right? Yeah, like Ledger Shredder is also really good in Timna. That you don't have to attack the Ledger Shredder player if they don't attack with Ledger yeah. Shredder. You can still get in, right? I feel like the reason why it's so good, Timna, is that at its normally worse situation where it's only drawing one card a turn because there's almost always at least someone that you can get through with at least one some amount of damage. That is like still really good, and its ceiling of drawing three is like really what like a, a cantrip is in CDH. You know, like the idea of a cantrip is you replacing the card that you cast so that you stay at parity with cards with your opponents. But if you do that in CDH, you have three opponents, which is less than one opponent. So when you cantrip, you're actually still losing value because your opponents. They're, you're not at parity with them now because they have started with more cards than you. But Timna allows you to draw three cards. So does that make sense? Like if you have three opponents and you draw three cards, that's kind of like breaking card advantage parity because you yeah. caught up with all of them at once with your Timna. Exactly. Every time you draw a card for turn, you're down each of your you're, opponents. Yeah. Normally in Magic, you draw a card, they draw a card, so you're always at the same level of advantage. But now two other people are drawing cards. Right. So you're always at a disadvantage unless you gain that advantage back. And three cards, I, in my opinion, is the, yeah. the amount of cards where you like get that advantage back. Yeah. So no, I, I Timna is still always going to be good, but it is going to be a lot tougher to get the Timna in there too. So even when Timna does get in there, I think, uh, you know, not blocking, I think a lot of the times is still very respectable. And I think prioritizing evasive creatures is going to be a lot more relevant in Timna decks going forward. Things like yeah. Dragon's Rage Channeler that can gain flying and things like Ledger Shredder that we already talked about and things that are like naturally evasive that before, I feel like for a while, we didn't really care about that when you're playing Timna. Like you would have anything and it could probably get through, just get attacked with Mana Dorks or something like that. But now I think that pressure to have a couple of extra thoughts in your brewing towards like, I, maybe I should get some flyers in here, at least at Sarah's the one or two Sarah's Ascendant, drop. which Sarah's is also is really one. good with the Ranger Captain of Eos too, right? Yes. So, um, you know, there's a lot of synergistic, you know, cards that will come up like that that just, you know, end up being really good. So, all right, here's another situation. All right, yeah, oh, give it to me. We're, st we're still in this category of the CDH situation. Yeah, we're, we're, still, we're, we're still in this situation here. When is it right to scoop? Here's the situation. Okay. Yeah, here's the situation. Yeah. 
Um, your opponent <laughs> has, <laughs> yeah, your opponent has Draineth Magistrate and Uba Mask. Yeah. And it, they also have an Archon of Amiria out. <laughs> okay, so right? you can't cast spells anymore. They also and, have... Or draw cards. No. They also have Elish Norn and <laughs> Living Plane yeah. in play. I think now is a great time to we scoop. We can totally scoop. Yeah. Normally, so here's my f- kind of philosophy on scooping. The sorcery speed thing is a, a kind of a well-known part of a commander, but it's best to try to not s- scoop until your sorcery speed, which means like on your turn. So like if someone's attacking you, don't scoop just to make sure that they don't get their combat damage trigger so that somebody else can win. That's just lame. Like, Spite don't, play. Don't do that. That's what that it is. It just doesn't do anything for you. It doesn't improve your chances of winning because you remove all your chances right away. Um, but I do think it's definitely appropriate to talk to the table and be like hey i'm ready to concede when y'all are we seem dead here we're locked out like are you good to concede now you don't want to go out of your way to do that very quickly because if you think somebody has interaction you don't want to blow up their spot and they have to go now um like can you actually play it out like i have something like you don't want to blow someone's spot up but if it seems like the table is like you can kind of get a feel from everyone like how how is everyone doing right now like we're having a good like see how everyone's doing if they have their cards down on the table and they're just waiting you can kind of ask some questions and see like you know do you have interaction maybe they'll give you a nod or something like that um, but if it seems like you're all locked out, I think it's it's totally fair to just scoop and concede. Yeah. We, we're dead. We don't need to finish this out. Yeah, but otherwise, like, that's the only time that I would want to scoop. Yeah. Like, it's only in that scenario. Otherwise, like, my whole point is that I'm trying to win, and what's immediately going to reduce my win percentage yep. in this game to zero is by just saying, I quit. Yeah. And just flown up, you know, I, I this think, white flag. I don't know if there is a correct number. Maybe there is, but for me, it's around like 99%. Like, once my yeah. chance of winning becomes 1%, I'm yeah. rounding down. That's now zero. We're out. We're done. Yeah. But if I have like a 2% chance to win, I'm probably going to keep on trying to play to my outs just because yeah. it's interesting. I, I, well, that I distinction, think, how the fuck do you make the difference? I, mean, I, I think don't it know, also but. depends because I also feel like if I'm playing against like Croc, Croc and Sakashima. If Croc's got enough Crocs out, I'm good. Like, that's how I am, too. Like, I don't need to play to, like, your billionth of a percentile We're, chance yeah, that's fine. that you're going to miss. Like, no, you got this. Yeah. Let's just keep going. Gitrog, too. Gitrog is a prime example of, yeah. like, the, the loop will end. You just don't exactly know the order that it'll end, and that kind of matters to some people yeah. because you can technically hit the Titan over and over again as you're going through your Gitrog loop. I don't care. Which could happen, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, yes, like, if a mathematical anomaly happens, sure, there's a chance that I win the game. But in like every logical scenario where this plays out, your loop will finish in the state that you want it to, even if there's a theoretical number that you could happen a thousand billion times in a row where it doesn't get to that state. I'm fine with that. To me, that's the 1%. I don't know if that's a true 1%, 99% of like when my win percentage gets to there, but that's how I It's got to it. be like really close to there yeah. too. Also, you know the feeling that you get like when you're doing awesome stuff in the game and like you're actually getting to kill people. You don't get to do that when people scoop. That's true, right? I don't know. I don't, don't want to take that away from people. I don't want to take that away from people Certainly either, not. right? So because I, I want to watch, watch that. I want to watch people go through their combo. That's right? like the most fun part about Commander. I think. Also, part of your win percentage should be they f- didn't put the win con in their deck. And then now they just have to like go, oops, that's not how this works. That's great. Yeah. Now I have to end the game with they could like mess something up. else in play, right? They could mess up. They could totally mess they could up. They could totally mess up. I miss click in real life all the time. Yeah. I, all I the time. I don't think I would ever scoop to a combo. I mean, I guess I, we were just talking about how I would scoop to a Git Rock, but that one's pretty, the Git Rock line is pretty straightforward. There's a, you know, a, a, an equation that's 14 pages long that I could look at that would explain it. I get that. But if someone's like going through their loop and it's still like they're still tapping their elves or they're still flipping their coins. I'm not going to interrupt them, but no. I will trust them to say like, okay, I'm at the point now where I'm not going to whiff anymore. I will, I will trust them most of yeah. the time. You know, and maybe if I'm in a stranger's pod, if I'm in a tournament, maybe I would want to make them make sure that they explain it correctly. Yeah, make sure that I understand. But I'll I'm, say, I'm I'll I'm say, uh, let me see a win con. Yeah, let me. And, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Let me see. Well, how do you win? Kill me. Show me. Tell I me. I want to see your win con. I want to yeah, yeah. show hear, me. What are you going to do? I want to hear me? you do it. You're a wizard yeah. right now. I want to. I need to hear you cast your spells. I need to know how I die and in this magical way. Boom. Whatever. Yeah, it is. Exactly. <laughs> do you want to play another game? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what that is. Yeah. Um, nice. Okay. So that's that's the only time that we're ever going to scoop and see. Yeah. I think those are good. That, yeah. All right. Um. Playing with a uh, Mystic Remora at the oh. table. Playing with oh. a Mystic Remora at the table. This is a question that is far too deep. This is um, far too deep. The Prisoner's Dilemma. Do you, are you familiar? 
I don't want to begin to explain it. So I'm I'm familiar with the prisoner's dilemma. For how I have decided to interpret it is you should do nothing. You should not feed the fish ever. Yeah. But if you feed the fish and you can win through it, there are situations where you don't think there's anything that your opponent can draw that would stop you. You can win. If you cast Grand Abolisher and that resolves, I'm letting them draw a lot of cards with the Mystic Amora. And there are situations that are much less safe than that in which I would give my opponent a couple cards to make sure that I can go through my win. That's because that's that's I, I know for sure that that will get me to a win, and I don't trust my opponents to not pay for the fish when it gets to them. So I want to win before they get a chance to have that option to pay or not. Um, so that's tough. Like that's hard to like drum up scenarios of like when is it appropriate and when is it not appropriate. I have a couple times that I started. I've started okay. to think is appropriate too. When the table does not feed fish for like three turns, and then you realize that the rate is seven mana for two cards. Yep, that's true. Boom. Totally comfortable with that. Yes. Totally comfortable with that. They spent so much, so many resources getting themselves into, you know, keeping the table at the standstill. But if you're especially like the first person that can come out of that a little bit more quickly, then I think that can be a little bit more helpful then too. I think it also depends. If you think that your opponents are not going to feed the fish, I think maybe you should feed the fish. If you think that they're creature decks and they're going to play mana dorks and they're going to play around it, it's probably better for you to, to feed it and get ahead and give them some cards and just be able to make sure that you're ahead. But if you do that and you're wrong and they do feed the fish, you are screwed. Because if everyone feeds the fish, the fish holder will win the game very quickly. So you have to balance that. On like, but you're also going to get slack from people if, they, if they're not feeding the fish and you are and the fish player wins. That will probably be like your fault. If you feed them seven cards and they win the game, then that's probably your fault. Yeah. You have to weigh those odds. Sometimes you have to say, I, you know, I think there's maybe 15% chance that they win. And I think that there's, you know, maybe a, a 45% chance that I could win. I'm going to take that odds and say, okay, you know, maybe I can win right now. And that would be good. Well, that's why I also like to look at that ratio, like yeah. the, the mana to cards ratio. Like it, a divination is terrible. Yeah. Divination is not good. <laughs> I agree with you there. Right. Like, so like, so that's already like but that's there's a fish in play for like three turns at that point by the time it gets to it to be a divination um but like if it's in play immediately like i especially don't want to feed it that turn as that's when they'll get most of the value yeah. from it um on the contrary though like everyone who plays fish thinks about it differently right and depending on what you draw you might if you get fed enough in that first turn you might just let it go if and it's then ancestral try to recall the game. if it just draws you three cards for one mana i'll just let it die that's sometimes fine. right yeah and if you need like the rest of your mana to then like cast your commander which might also be a card advantage engine at that point yeah i think i'm totally comfortable with like just giving away the fish at that point which is like a weird you know kind of debate you have to have in your head of like if i give this person three cards right now do you think do i think that it'll cause them to f not keep the fish around and thus i can cast 10 cards on my next turn and win and i don't think that their ancestral recall will be able to stop me from winning next turn like those are conversations that you'll have to have and it'll seem really bad when you give the person three cards but if you think it'll make them sack it because you want to really go off in the next turn maybe that's something you can do maybe you can kind of bait them into getting rid of it when they really should have kept it because you weren't even you know, you weren't done yet. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And the problem with these Mystic Remora decks is that they're all in blue. So they all play counter spells, right? So like yeah. you... So they're going to try to protect it too <laughs> if you try right? to kill it yeah, or something. Yeah, exactly, right? Not only are they going to try to protect it, um, but they're also just drawing into interaction that's going to stop you, right? Yes, and interaction that can protect their stuff too. It's like a, like the Force of Will argument. Like it's a blue card, so it's good. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's you get to play other good cards. Whereas right? like, yeah. although red has some real bangers in Doc's Head Extortionist and Underworld Breed, it's it's kind of shallow and like how deep red can get sometimes where if you're in blue you get access to like a whole bunch of really good staples all the counter spells everything everything is so good but red you really like don't have those things so just being in blue you just get like a more deep well of cards to choose from and a lot of them are really good interaction like you were saying yeah exactly now what if there's two mystic remoras in play every situation so different See, I feel like this kind of works out because a lot of the times what happens is, you know, they'll just fight with each other. That's true. They will fight with each other. They're also they also might start feeding each other. And if they start feeding each other, then you get way behind because then there's two players that are keeping up on a level that's going upwards. And you're not only not progressing your board, but falling behind 
but theirs because they're progressing at a rate. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, that gets even worse. So that depends. It, it, I, there's got to be a threshold, and there's probably a mathematical like answer to this question that I don't know what it is. But there's got to be a number of like once my opponent has drawn X amount of extra cards, it doesn't matter anymore because they've drawn so many more. And there's also got to be a number for when you should not feed it at all because any cards is too much. But that depends situation to situation. And also what you have in your deck. If you can play around it, definitely play around it. If that's an option, if you're a Mana Dork deck and you can choose to play the Soul Ring or the Birds of Paradise, play the Birds of Paradise. Hands that's down. easy. Yeah, I think that's really the best way to go is that if you can play around it, play, play around, around it. it. Yeah. yeah, but there are... and. There are situations where I do think it's okay to feed the fish. It's it's going to bite in the ass sometimes. You just have to kind of accept that. Like, you are going to give the game away sometimes, and those are just maybe risks yeah. that, if you want to improve your win rate, might be important to take. But who the fuck am I? I've not, you know, I never want anything. That's just my philosophy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think just not feeding it is really the best way to deal with it. Because, like, if you if you deal with it in play, you're most like unless you're playing, like, Reclamation Sage, you're playing something that's going to feed it anyway you have pyroblast you have uh, i guess mental misstep is the only other way that you can yeah, get around the counter, it, right? counter on the stack yeah exactly and even then i don't i i like to save my counters for win conditions i don't like to save my counters for a mystic yes. remora unless it's mental yeah. misstep okay so yes that's true i am on the boat that i will save all counter spells for win conditions but my caveat is efficient ways to stop early card advantage pieces like Mystic Remora and Ristic Study too. I think Ristic Study study should be high priority on like counter it. Depends on the pod. If you think yeah. the pod's going to play around it, maybe you let it stick. But R Ristic Study stays around forever. So like it's it, for so many decks, it just straight up stops their win condition. A lot of decks who have to loop cards, um, you're, you're going to be feeding them a, a whole ton of cards and they're eventually going to find a way to stop you. So I think those cards should kind of be prioritized as like basically win conditions, I think, in the right situations. Um, I, I'm definitely fine to force the rule of Ristic Study if I have it, I think. That's fair. Okay. So you're kind of on like, yeah, okay. I get that. I get that. It, it yeah. depends. It, obviously, I'm going to say that a whole bunch of times, but it depends on the pot situation. When do you think it's better than other situations? Um, but there are a ton of situations that I would definitely yeah. counterspell Mystic Remora like right away if I could. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, th I think that's fair. Because a lot of the time in like the late game, like I'll just, you know, try my best to play around Ristic Study and Mystic Remora. But not everyone's going to do that. No, but it kind of gives you the opportunity to let them deal with other stuff too. If there are other players that are still trying to win or trying to interact with their card draw, yep, they will still put up protection so that they can still have that. And if you can find the openings then where you can still win and play around those effects then too i think that can you know still be something you can use to your benefit quite a bit definitely so yeah i can definitely there's a situation where say you have console thoracle in your hand and a counter spell someone plays a ristic study and you can counter it but you choose not to because on your turn you can pay the two ristic study triggers on your two combo pieces and keep your backup for protecting your win condition that is a great time to not counter the ristic study definitely do that but if you are in a food chain deck and you need to get rid of that ristic study and you have a Mist Held Griffin and a Force of Will in your hand, fucking fire that shit off. Get rid of it. Like, because if it stops your win condition, you're going to have to get rid of it eventually. It, now, if you have, you know, maybe you have removal and you're like, I'll just kill it later with my Abrupt Decay that I have, that's fine. Yeah. But I, I definitely think it's it, it makes total sense, if especially if you're in a deck that's win condition cares about Ristic Study, to counter that shit right on the stack. I guess it makes sense. Well, counter things that are on the stack to counter are like, that's all like a whole other situation. Yeah. Or like, like when like, to counter stuff. Like, Ristic Study is on the stack. That, that That's a situation. Situation. Yeah. In, in that case, you know, that's when Ristic Study, I would think, is looks, looked at as a stacks piece as opposed to exactly just be. like a card draw. It should be looked as a right? stacks piece. It and, should and, just say all oh, your spells cost yeah. one more. That's what everyone should read that card as. And but depending on your don't. deck, there, it does make sense to counter a lot of different stacks pieces. Like Ad Nauseum decks actively might want to counter uh, an Archon of Emeria, which stops them from winning the game. But I would also view that as interaction. That's like, like you were going to counter the counter spells that prevented you from casting your ad nauseum this is basically the same thing just before your ad nauseum yeah uh, yeah that makes sense you know backwards way I, I get it all right we got one more situation we're gonna we're, i want to talk about here okay um this is when you're making a play and then the rest of the table tells you that's not the play oh what do you mean or at least one other player is saying oh no you shouldn't do that you should do this and then every other player chimes in 
with their input <laughs> as to what to it should be. No, this okay. is this. Well, it didn't also just happen to me. This <laughs> happened to me for years. <laughs> <laughs> this has continuously happened to you all throughout time, your life. Right? Yeah, all the time. So right? you start going through your win condition, and right. someone says, "Wait, do it better. Do it like this." No, no, no. I'm not saying like that. Okay. I'm talking about like you're using a bounce spell on something oh. that someone doesn't expect you to do necessarily right sure. like someone else thinks that you could be using your removal of your interaction oh, like do you listen to politicking is your question yeah that's yeah, i guess like, is it I appropriate guess to listen to what politicking? It is, right this is a great question that i actually have a passion to answer about is no you should never listen to politicking hands down that Here's, is the play to win i guess this is fast answer is do no. not listen to someone who's politicking you no. can make your own decision and it might line up with theirs if the ones that, if it's the one that they told you out loud that's totally fine but here's the thing, okay? So if someone is politicking with you, it's because they want to win the game, right? Just like real life. Right. So like if they're – there's no reason for them to speak unless they want to further their chances to win the game. So if you listen to them, you're doing what they want. Like why would you listen to someone who's politicking? You should never – like I can't – there's no reason to. Now – if someone reminds you of like, hey, we're going to die, don't kill that instead of this, I don't think of that as politicking. That's not politicking. If they're that's, saying like, hey, by the way, we don't want to all lose the game, right? Yeah, that's, that's just a reminder. That's a different thing. But yeah. if they say, hey, you shouldn't kill my risk of study, kill their risk of study instead, as long as you got a reason that you feel is right, kill, listen to yourself. Don't listen to them because they have their own interests in mind, not yours. They don't know what's <laughs> in your hand. Yeah, they don't know what's in your hand. You don't know what's in their hand and you know, maybe they could show you or whatever, but it's better to trust yourself. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. Own up to that decision and say, okay, I was wrong. I missed that. Well, that's totally fine. But as long as you can back up your play and you know that, you know, what you're doing is right in your mind, fucking go for it that's the thing is like uh, yeah i want to reiterate this just that anyone who's politicking is politicking because they want to win the game so if you listen to them you're you're doing what they want which is what to win the game which is maybe not what you want because you want to win the game so don't listen to them like if you were playing a sport and someone says hey don't score this turn please like i I'll, i won't score next turn trust me if you don't if you don't score this turn <laughs> you're like okay here you go take the ball it's like wait what <laughs> no like that's messed up that's absolutely yeah. messed up um I, this is a, a very top level. This conversation can be very deep, and there's many different ways that politics can come into play, um, in in different ways. And, and it's I'm not saying don't listen to players who are good at magic. And if you're talking with friends, and you know if they're telling you to consider things, that's a that's a you know that's a different thing. But don't not take advice from people, but understand that like listen to yourself at the end of the day you can hear what the words that they're saying i hear what you're saying but don't do it just because that the, you they told you to do it like think and make sure that what you're doing furthers your game plan it's what you want to happen not just like what your opponents want to happen unless you're playing like you know casual or whatever if you don't care why would you listen to this podcast and you know i i do whatever you want i'm talking about specifically cdh i i do want to highlight that point that you that you made though too you know don't don't be afraid to you know take the advice when it comes yeah. up um because a lot of times you know there are there are going to be times that you forget things Definitely. and that you know someone are it, someone else is going to point out to you you know there, there's certainly nothing wrong with saying oh yeah shoot i forgot about that right um and then and then doing that but yeah no i i totally agree because every single time you can go back especially early on the channel <laughs> every single time that i ever listened to tyler <laughs> to brandon to you, you the game to Nate, right away it was just a, it would just lose me the game <laughs> yeah within one or two turns <laughs> and it just would it would just not work out especially and a lot of those times i was in like winning scenarios too right <laughs> yeah. like it can it can honestly really set you back and put you in a, in a bad spot so yeah just make sure that the, yeah like i said the decisions yeah. that you're making further your game plan and improve your chances of winning the game especially if it's like a, a lower risk scenario than two then yeah. you can certainly trust your gut yeah for sure <laughs> that was <laughs> We don't have a way to end it yet. We don't have a way to end it yet. That was a great. That was a great. That was those are some great CDH topics you came up with there, Cameron. Yeah, those are some uh, some a bunch of different situations that you could find yourself in in CEDH. I'm really happy we were able to do this. Me too. I said that really well. I I, I think you did too. Um, I'm really glad you could join us today, Dylan. Thank you for being on the Play to Win podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching or listening. If you'd like to support us directly, you can do so at Patreon, like our $100 patrons. Baby Jeebus and Demon of Razgrees. Check out all of our merch at playtowinmtg.com. If you want to support us at no additional cost to you, check out our affiliate links down below. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time.
We forgot to do this live in the studio, so here I am now. A uh, special shout out to our $50 patrons. Mitchell Shepard, Justin, Eli Richty, Man Solo, Nikola Marikovic, Steven Schlichty, That Green Guy, Plantain Jackson, Isaiah Berliski, Michael Lyon, Pedro, Byron Wang, Windwave, C, Kawaja A. Hamid, Jacob Depp, CZ, Michael Ballou, Jan Wildfang, Sleepy Jarvis, Thomas Bueno, Swampy McGee, Lauren Connell, David Nelson, Vinny Bianca, Jormags, and James Noon, 845. Thank you all. <laughs> 